Welcome to the car guys. This week we're in the Rolls-Royce Phantom Coupe and we're on our way to the main Aston Martin Lagonda factory at Gaydon in Warwickshire for a VIP tour. This seems like an appropriate car to bring to the Aston Martin factory. The Rolls-Royce Phantom Coupe is also a great British brand, luxury, poise. It's built here in Britain and it's something that we can be very, very proud of. It's also a good opportunity to get reacquainted with the Phantom Coupe. It's been a while since I've driven it. It's just come back from a service at Rolls-Royce Bristol. It's the perfect car to take on a long journey like this. It's luxurious, it's quiet, it's comfortable, it's elegant. A lot of the roads are dual carriageway and motorway, so you just want something that can just waft along, get you to your destination, relaxed and composed. Most people dream of having a Rolls-Royce at some point in their lives and I never really thought I was one of those people. Whether it's because I was spending too much time watching Salamandrin on YouTube, I don't know. There's just something about this model that is deeply interesting. Whether it's the fact that very clearly it's a phantom drop head that's got a hard top welded to the top of it, you can see the seams on the front, but the way that the roof flows down to the back of the car, the size of the bonnet compared to the upright stance of the main cabin, which to me evokes many of the Rolls Royces of old. It's just so elegant. It's just such a stylish car. It's rare. People give it the knowing nod, which is always an indicator of a great car. And as a luxury vehicle, which is what I needed, it's absolutely perfect. It's got exactly the prestige and luxury and performance that you want. Not many people know it even exists. There will never be another Phantom Coupe because of course Rolls-Royce now has the Wraith. There's just something so James Bond villain about it. No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. See what I mean? Ahead of me, we've got beautiful clear dials that are utterly timeless. You really cannot tell what decade it is. It could be the 40s, 50s, 60s. It does not give it away at all. And when you're driving at night, the soft glow that you get in the dashboard is reminiscent of those old sort of light bulbs that you used to get in vintage cars. I love the fact that the controls look and perform like old vintage controls, but yet they're modern. I love that. I love the chrome. I love the commanding position. I like the fact that it's almost as tall as a Range Rover. It gives you a commanding view of the road. It's got a decent sized boot. It's got a motorized tailgate, which you can actually sit on. Two people can sit on actually. And I love the fact that when they created this car, they didn't think people wanted many different driving modes, which was very much the trend at the time. So you've got drive, neutral, and reverse. No Sport Plus, no one, two, three, no extra driving modes, that's it. There's probably a little bit more wind noise from the A-pillar than I expected on this car, but it's not super intrusive. It doesn't spoil the journey. These huge 21-inch tires, I mean, it gives it real presence. Normally, the larger the wheel, the less good the ride is, and it's true that the ride is slightly worse than the standard Phantom. But for something that's a little bit more sporty, a little bit more caddy, I think it probably suits it. I like the suicide doors. I love the fact that you can press a button to close them. It's not really necessary, but I like the fact that you can do it. I like the power, I like the smoothness of the delivery of the power. I like the simplicity, not so good. Visibility out the back is, uh, is not brilliant, probably because the car is so large it follows the curvature of the earth, which means that you can't really see directly behind you for too far. I love the fact there are umbrellas in the doors, although I never ever use them. I just love the fact that this is a, an enormous piece of ironmongery. It's a colossal Brunellian device. You don't so much drive it as you coax it into bends. Rolls-Royce is really, for a long time, were not aimed at, nor did they appeal, to younger owners. And by younger, I mean less than 60. The Rolls-Royce brand and the cars themselves have undergone a complete transformation, probably starting with the new Phantom on which this car is based. 
ever since then the image has improved dramatically the average age has come down by I think 35 years and a lot of people are now appreciating the luxury and the history of this great brand and getting into cars which they never thought they would and I definitely count myself among one of those in many ways it's a similar story to Aston Martin during the 80s Aston Martin tended to be a little whiff of James Bond and a lot of whiff of cars that didn't used to run properly. They had bulges, they were, you know, they were, they were big, heavy cars with walnut interiors and Connolly leather, and you just could not see anyone wanting one. But I would say with the introduction probably of the DB9 and the V8 Vantage, Aston Martin's fortune started to turn. Certainly in more recent years, their growth and popularity and reliability and desirability have skyrocketed. I'm not the biggest fan of the design of anything post a DB9. I think they've been a little bit fussy, there's too many cuts, there's strange angles, and I've really not been seduced by them at all, in the flesh or in photos. There's a huge amount of energy at Aston Martin at the moment. There's plenty of new models being launched. Super cool projects like the Valkyrie and the road cars particularly with their partnership now with AMG, are probably the best they've ever been in terms of overall performance and package and style. That's what makes it interesting to visit them now, just after they've launched the Superleggera, their latest V12 flagship. This is a chance to see all the cars in one place, and I guess there's no better way to see whether an Aston Martin is the sort of thing we should have in the car guy's garage again. So here we are, we're approaching Aston Martin now. All the signs are pointing us that way. It's quite exciting actually, I've never been to Aston Martin factory before. Didn't go to the old one and I haven't gone to this new super high-tech one. Jason went to the old one when they were building the DB7 and he's got many tales of craftsman hand polishing aluminium bodies. I think this place will be a bit more space age but crucially, all Aston Martins are handmade. We're not going to see a production line of robots and everything being automated. I'm expecting to see craftsmen still there, but just in a futuristic setting with modern tools. Yeah, okay, have you been here before at all, sir? No. Okay, sir. You go through here, Yep. go round to your left, park up in the VIP area, and the VIP reception door will be in front of you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So here we are at Aston Martin in Gaydon. This is the main production facility. I'm surrounded by Aston Martins of all different types in the car park. I can see one of the new Vantages in that strange sort of limey green color up on the rocks ahead of us. And behind us here, we've got the main factory, which looks pretty cool actually in, in a sort of sandstone. So while we're waiting for the tour to begin, let's have a look at the interior of the Phantom Coupe. Black interior, so it's all black outside, black inside as well. What I love about it is the piano wood. I especially love piano wood interiors. The first thing you notice getting into a Phantom Coupe is that you almost always strike your head on the roof line because although this is an enormous car the roof line is actually quite low and the way you get in is quite high so it's quite a small gap that you actually have to get through to get into the car you have to really bundle yourself in here or as I learnt you sort of shuffle your way in whilst craning your head over to stop whacking it on the roof so heaven knows what someone six foot and above is going to do getting in here it's not the most dignified way to get into a Rolls Royce that really leads to the other surprising thing about a Phantom Coupe which is although the car is gargantuan the inside isn't it's actually quite small in here room for four adults obviously but there's not as much leg room or general space as you think there would be there's not a huge amount of space up here in the front and in the back it's the same, and I think really that's because the, the roof line swoops down over the back seats, which means that there's just, you know, an awful lot of this car is taken up with the boot and the bonnet, and there's not actually that much space for passengers, which again, a little bit strange when you're talking about a car that's the same size as a double-decker bus. Inside here, you've got a glove box, which you press with this big 
beautiful chrome button. So that's the main glove box, which holds literally nothing. It's a strange size. It's a big door, but the gap inside is tiny. But you do also have the controls for manually raising and dropping the Spirit of Ecstasy, open the boot, and also to set the clock. Then below it, you've got another glove box, which is, again, a slightly strange size and quite flat. So you can hardly fit anything in there either. Rather than two small glove boxes, one big one would have been better. Just a thought. You've also got storage in the center console here, which you don't really see, but you push this center area and the, a big slab of piano wood softly glides out. And then you push back the cover to reveal some phone dialing controls and another little cubby hole. It's useful for things like sunglasses or perhaps a Wolfer PPK. There's a huge structure in between the main seats here, and that houses the iDrive controls for the infotainment system, navigation, etc. Uh, iDrive being an anagram of totally shit. Another big cubby hole door, and this is where the phone goes when you connect that. You've got another lifting up section which glides open as everything in this car glides. In here you've got the seat controls so all of the directions and memory of the seats are located in this section accessed via a beautiful chrome nipple. And then just below it you've got the heated seat controls. Underneath that probably one of the finest ashtrays that you'll ever find in a car. I love the Art Deco accoutrements. It, it helps to convey a sense of elegance and also a sense of timeless luxury. Probably worth mentioning the iDrive. This is a bit of an Achilles heel of Phantoms in general. To access the iDrive, what you do is you lightly tap the front of this panel. What's supposed to happen is the iDrive joystick gradually appears. However, very often it doesn't open at all and no amount of pushing does anything and in fact after a while it sticks a little bit further in than it should do. I mentioned this to the service department and they said ah yeah they all do that sir but if you want it fixed we're going to have to replace it and that's going to cost £1,200. So what you actually have to do is jam in a credit card or similarly thin plastic device and just flip it out which to me doesn't seem very Rolls-Royce. And this is probably the only thing that dates this Rolls-Royce Phantom because the iDrive menus and systems here are now horrifically old. In terms of the dashboard itself, in the centre you've got the speedometer, on the right you've got the fuel gauge and engine temperature, and on the left of the three dials you've got the famous power reserve gauge which shows you how much power is still left in reserve compared to what you're using at the moment. Starts at 100%, when you boot the throttle it drops down but generally it never goes lower than 20%. Then it was time for the tour itself, so we were taken through the VIP entrance and main reception where we were allowed to see some of the new models including the new Valkyrie, a Zagato Special and also the super secret new Zagato Shooting Brake. We also got a look at the full-on racing car and we were about to go into the factory and film it all just for you when a lovely lady came out and said we unfortunately couldn't film anymore. So that was the Aston Martin factory. No cameras or camcorders allowed in the actual factory itself as they've got many secret development models in there. But we did get to see the brand new Zagato shooting brake. So the sort of slightly estate -y sort of looking Zagato special, which was very exciting. They're really actually a lot cooler looking than I expected. And we got to see the new DBS Volante, the soft top DBS, which hasn't even been announced yet. So the Phantom Coupe is going to rocket us down to Banbury and we're going to go on their GT simulator. Here I am at Base Performance which is a simulator expert company that also sells simulators and we are continuing our Aston Martin day here to drive an Aston Martin Vantage GT car. We don't wear seatbelts. Yeah, you don't need to be strapped in. Uh, we'll start off on the start finish line rather than the pit lane. It's
Right, so that was an epic simulator session. You can see I'm completely exhausted, totally frazzled, my nerves are frayed, but it was great fun and it completely simulates what driving's like on a track. It was just scary. Uh, so now it's time to take the Phantom Coupe uh, back to Car Guys HQ. I mean, overall, I'd have to say that I'm still totally head over heels in love with this car. It might not get a huge amount of wheel time in the Car Guys, but every time you get in, it's a special event. Next stage, I think, is some kind of tour with Jason and I, and we'll give both of our opinions on the car. Stretch its legs. It's not the sort of car you take to the Alps, but it is the sort of car that you take on a more relaxed sort of driving holiday. Maybe a tour around the UK, maybe a tour into Europe. Thanks for watching the video, guys. Hope you enjoyed this update on the Rolls-Royce Phantom. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe to the channel. We very much appreciate it. Leave comments and likes, and we do read them all. And uh, we'll be along for another episode soon.